Jósit kívánok! Szeretettel köszöntök mindenkit a Lengyel Intézetben. Ígérem, hogy nagyon rövid leszek, mivel tudom, hogy mindenki a mesterkózust várja a film alap szervezésében. Megtisztelő, hogy üdvözölhetjük ma este Krzysztof Zanoszi urat, az egyik leghíresebb lengyel filmrendezőt, aki biztos vagyok benne, hogy a mai esemény nagyon tanulságosnak és érdekesnek bizonyul mindannyiunknak. És jó tanulást kívánok! Én is egy mondat erejét szeretnék csatlakozni a bevezető részhez. Nagyon sok szeretettel köszöntöm Önöket titeket a Fast Forward programunknak a ma esti részében, és nagyon örülök annak, hogy sokan tudjuk, hogy holnap is ott lesznek a kis workshopon a Krisztof Zanosztival. Szeretném még azt elmondani, hogy egyrészt egy új partnerrel gazdagodott ma este a program, és ez a lengyel intézet, és nagyon sok hálás vagyok, hogy itt lehetőségek. köszönjük a szervezésben minket segítséget, meg az egyből pozitív válasz. Pálos György segített az elterészéről, most nincs itt, de majd remélem valaki elmondja neki, hogy hálásan megköszöntük a segítségét. És még egy technikai üzenet csak, ma hirdettük meg, február 9-én Kátriás Fóri látogat Budapestre, aki a Low Budget Filmmakingről fog előadást tartani az eltén. Szerintem sokan jönnek itt, akiket érdekelhet ez a téma, úgyhogy kérlek titeket, kérlek titeket, hogy regisztráljatok. Aki még nem iratkozott föl a hírlevelünkre, azt tegye meg, mert az akkor egyből lehet értesülni a hírekről, és akkor jó tanulást. Köszönöm. Még engedjük meg, hogy lengyelül is üdvözöljön a rendező urak. Po polsku, panie Krzysztofie, serdecznie witamy w programie Instytutu Polskiego. Wielki to dla nas zaszczyt, wielka radość i życzymy owocnej pracy z adeptami sztuki filmowej w Węgier. Well, we are in the linguistic clash because I don't speak Hungarian at all, so I'm very curious what was said at the beginning. I would guess probably. But with your language, it's even difficult to guess because there are so few words that we have in common. But this problem was known for centuries. Now, I have to spend some time with you today and tomorrow. And I understand that with most of you, tomorrow we will be talking about your projects. So today I may talk about some more general questions. And I have to introduce myself, first of all, because you don't need to know me. And the first thing to know is that I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> really, because I represent Jurassic Park. I'm almost 80. I'm very old. It is a surprise to me. It will be a surprise to you one day. <laughs> but it is good to know that there are still filmmakers who were born before World War II, and that's me. I was born in 79. And I survived the war in Poland. I'm from, partly from on the, uh, on my father's side. I have some Italian descendants. And when the censorship in Poland, in communist time, put name, my, my name on the blacklist, not for a long time, but there was some time when my name was not possible in print, my remote Italian cousins were pro protesting via Italian embassy because their refrigerators could not be uh, publicized <laughs> uh, because they reacted on the name. So uh, this Italian ancestry is part of my identity, but not, not very, it's not very evident, except maybe one thing where that could be of some use for you to think about. I was reading a lot as a young man. I don't recommend anybody to read them too much because then you have glasses all your life long, as I have. Less reading, better eyes. <laughs> but if you read, well, read only masterpieces. Why to waste time reading other things? Anyway, I was reading classics and I read quite a lot of Balzac, Honoré Balzac. And he helped me enormously because the one of the 
permanent figures in his writing is a poor cousin. And when I went to, the Ita to Italy for the first time to meet my multimillionaire cousins, I had already experience of Balzac. I knew what are the feelings and what are the typical situations when you are a poor cousin. <laughs> for me to pay my coffee was a problem. And my, uh, my cousins were ready to send their private plane to bring me. And they never financed my film, so there was no practical continuation. But human experience was quite rich, and maybe if we have time I will tell you some anecdotes, because these are things that are useful for scripts. When there is a contrast, when there is a conflict, there is a, the basis of the story. So, my other confession, which is probably necessary, is to say I didn't start as a filmmaker. I was making some amateur films as I was doing some amateur theater. But I studied physics, and I'm very proud that I studied physics. I'm still in love with physics. Unfortunately, physics was never in love with me. <laughs> so after four years, I had to quit. And it was a great, great blow to me. But I understood that there is no chance for a Nobel Prize. And nothing below Nobel, Nobel Prize would interest me. And I studied later on philosophy. But it's also something to be explained. I studied philosophy in the early 60s. And in one university, State University of Krakow, there was a normal curriculum of philosophy, not Marxist. It was an exception. And I, I take advantage of this exception. So I have some physical background, and I will be talking about it later, so I want to gain some credibility. Of course, I know very little of physics, but I have still very, very strong interest in physics. And what else? And because of my amateur films, I was admitted to the Film Academy. And I passed the examination. It was very difficult, very selective. We had almost 100 candidates for one place. What sounds hopeless. But it was not hopeless, because when I've seen my colleagues, I understood that out of 100, 50 are rather loony, so rather slightly, uh, let us say, beyond the norm. And with the others, with the 50, you can compete better. And out of 50, I knew that at least 25 are not, uh, rather less good than me. So finally, I, 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 I didn't lose hope. And when you have hope, you sometimes win. <laughs> I won, I was admitted, and then I was kicked out after three years. At the beginning, I was the most promising student, and after three years, I was the least promising student. It is also a good lesson, because you understand that this will happen to you all your life long in arts. Once you will be praised, once you will be criticized, once somebody will tell you that you are a genius, and tomorrow somebody will tell you you are a zero, you are nobody, and your work is rubbish. And you have to have your own orientation, and you will always have your doubts, because we ever always have doubts. If we have no <coughs> doubts, we are dead. So our life is not easy, no doubt, that's, that's for sure. And now I wanted to be a little bit more theoretical and tell you some basic things that I'm convinced are relevant to us. And we'll be talking about narrative art. So to me, Europe has been formed by its own style of narration. And this happened at a time when Greek drama was developed. And we owe a lot to the Greeks. We usually don't understand it. We take our storytelling, we take it for granted that this is the normal way of telling stories. Only when I lecture in India, or in China, but more in India, I see how different we are in thinking. And I notice that my Indian students, students and I have many of them, bring me always opposite solution than the solution I have in mind. They have different view on life because their narrative patterns are different from ours. That's why their cinema is so different and so authentic. I wouldn't say the same about China. China is a 
fascinating continent, but I didn't trace, maybe I didn't know China enough, I didn't trace much of their own style of storytelling. But Chinese films are far more influenced by Hollywood than Indian films. Indian films you recognize immediately. And you see the difference with Europe. Because in Greek vision of the world, our life is a little bit like the passage of the day. Sun rises, then there is a climax, the noon, and there is a sunset. In India, they always want to come to the beginning. They talk about cycles. There is broken harmony, which is restored at the end. This is something what we use sometimes as a structure of a rondo closed story, but it's rather marginal in European storytelling. It is crucial for India. They have different view of the world. As they have different view of progress, they, don't, they are not very keen to recognize progress, and we are obsessed by progress. So differences are very deep, in fact. But we have to use our storytelling. And now I know how boring it is to listen to somebody who speaks in a foreign language and uh, speaks about theory. So maybe I will make a first short break and show you something. Don't panic, it will be only four minutes. And it is a very elementary example that will help us to focus on question, what is a conflict? Why in European storytelling we find conflict a motor of, 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 of the whole narration? Unlike Indians. Indians would rather go away from the conflict, will put it outside. But it's not my, my task to talk about Indian uh, narration, but I would like to say something about European narration. And I was commissioned a couple of years ago, you would see me on the screen, I'm probably 10 years younger, and many kilograms less. My wife complains that these kilograms are extra matrimonial. <laughs> uh, but all people get fat, that's natural. And <laughs> this film was commissioned by BBC, very prestigious, British Broadcasting Corporation. They commissioned uh, 10 different directors in Europe, each of them, to present their favorite work of art in four minutes. It was some kind of a joke, but I, I accepted it. And I thought immediately, how can I show something what is totally non-dramatic? I will show something and say, look how, how beautiful it is. This is absolutely intolerable in European storytelling. There must be a conflict. There must be something against something. We like stories when we are on the crossroads, where something may happen or may not happen. This is interesting. And that's always an elementary task to explain to the future storytellers. <coughs> Don't tell me that it is a dramatic event when a car hits a person. It's not dramatic at all. It is dramatic when a drunk man is standing on the, on the crossroads and the car is approaching. And car may hit this person or not. This is dramatic. But when he's already dead, it's not dramatic at all. It may be sad, but it doesn't create tension. Tension is only when there is a choice, when there is a potential. Some, you may go left or right. When you see a person standing on the window sill, it is dramatic because this person may jump or not. When he has already fallen, it's not dramatic. It's only sad he's dead. Presumably he was high enough. So um, we have to have this in mind that what is attractive is when you create some sort of alternative. When you have two options and one is to be chosen. This is ba a basis of our narration in European tradition. And I will show you this rather innocent four minutes. I will tell you why 
they have commissioned 10 times for minutes from various directors. The reason is very unambitious. All televisions need to have such a material that you can activate pressing the button. If a politician has shorter speech, if the parliamentary session is shorter, in the, if a football or soccer a t- a game is shorter, and you have next point of the, uh, of the program fixed, then you press the button and you put somebody's favorite work of art. As I was working in many televisions, having another, there was another use of my work. I will reveal it because maybe you don't know. All televisions have an alternative program in case of calamity. There may be a hurricane, there may be a big fire, there may be an inundation or a huge airplane crash or a train may kill 300 people. Then you must change the program immediately and there must be serious music and sad films. And I was on this list in German television, in French television. (laughs) Usually it takes one, one year, then they bring something else and they air the program correctly. I'm sorry that my films were considered suitable for funerals and (laughs) similar events. But they never worked this way, but they were selected. So this time it is in case that soccer game is shorter and you need four four minutes, or sometimes you need to use it twice, so it will be eight minutes. This is the way how program is administrated. At least it was ten years ago when I was shooting it. So let us see this little thing to give you a break. My name is Krzysztof Zanussi, I'm a filmmaker, and I'm Polish, although my name sounds Italian. And this is Krakow, a former capital of Poland, a medieval city full of historical monuments and museums. Let me invite you to have a short look at Krakow in winter. This is the Jagiellonian University, the sixth oldest university in Europe where Nicolaus Copernicus studied. This is the Royal Castle and the Cathedral. This museum is named after the founder, Prince Czartoryski, and it houses my favorite painting, which I would like to present to you, The Lady with Nervin by Leonardo da Vinci. Isn't she beautiful? Sorry to say that very many people don't even know that this painting exists. The name of Nervi has been totally overshadowed by the notorious Mona Lisa Gioconda from the Louvre. Would you like to compare them both? Which one would you prefer? <laughs> Specialists dispute whether it is really an Arminian's winter coat or just a reason considered a symbol of the pottery. The lady portrait by Leonardo is believed to be Cecilia Bellera, a mistress of Lodovico Sforza. Would such a lady really portrait with an animal symbolizing chastity held on her arms? 
widows. Let us have a look at her once again. Isn't she gorgeous? Then why is she so much less known to the public than her archie rival from the Louvre? The Louvre is a better dress. Mona Lisa takes some of her prestige from the place where she is exposed. Had she been in Krakow instead, would so many people know of her? Certainly not. But as you are now in Krakow with me, let us have once more a glimpse of Bob's pen. Who is more beautiful? Gioconda or Cecilia? I have no doubt. What about you? All right, it was just four minutes, so not more. And of course it is like a joke, but I think it is important to remember that only a situation which is open, which may bring us to one or another solution, is a dramatic situation. If there is no such situation, no narrative will be exciting. It applies to a novel, to a stage play, and very much to the film script. At least that's what I believe. But if we talk about an alternative, that things may go one way or another, we have also evaluate which way is a good way, which way is a bad way. If we don't evaluate it, if it is all the same, if it goes left or right, we have, we have lost something. So we need an evaluation and a scale of values. And I think this is a problem which we are facing today in Europe because most people in our profession are influenced by postmodern philosophy. And what this postmodern philosophy is launching is a total relativism. That means Everything is relative, nobody is good, nobody is bad, no act is good, no act is bad. Everything is mixed and confused. Well, I vulgarize the concept of postmodern. But in reality, postmodernism is a bastard of Marxism. First there were Marxists, and then when they finally abandoned their faith, Postmodernism was the way to give, to take absolution, to say nothing wrong because there is nothing wrong and nothing right. That's more or less, again, rather vulgar how I try to present it. But I think it is a very destructive and rather unfertile philosophy. But it's very much now common, and most critics, they don't know any scale of values. So they usually write about our works, about literature, about uh, films, about stage plays, like people write about culinary judgments. They say, I like this soup or I don't like this soup, but they cannot say why. If they don't know why, why should they care what they like or what they don't like? It's very difficult to identify with somebody's taste. but. Also remember, there is a good reminder that there is a pr of a proverb, which is a Latin proverb, de gustibus non disputantum, if I remember correctly. I studied Latin in school, but the endings are a problem. But there means you don't discuss about the taste. But remember, what does it mean? Taste you have or you don't have. It doesn't mean there are the various tastes. Not at all. If you don't hear that Beethoven or El Greco are geniuses, you are deaf or blind. And you should have no opinion. You have no right to have an opinion if you have no taste. Listen, learn, and then maybe you will develop your taste and then you will have right to have an opinion. But don't be too democratic. 
giving everybody a right to have an opinion when he has no culture behind him, no experience, <coughs> no scale of values. And of course I here go against the tide, because the tide says something opposite. And I think the postmodern ideas are over, some new ideas are growing, and I will try to talk about it to you, but let me also quote something practical. Of course, in philosophy I am totally ignorant, I was just a student and not a scholar, but I was lecturing a couple of years in a row in a very interesting American University in Switzerland, in Sasfe, there are summer courses, mostly for foreigners and for Americans, postgraduate and interdisciplinary. And one of the most important philosophers, Jacques Derrida, somehow a founder of postmodern philosophy, was lecturing next doors to me. And I was getting his students after his lecture. And of course, he was the Pope of the philosophy of the day, and I was a nobody who studied four years philosophy years ago. But when these American students were coming to my lecture, I was telling them, listen, he is a great famous philosopher, I am not, but he is a liar. <laughs> Don't believe him. And many followed me because I had a better accent. He had terrible accent, very French accent, <laughs> and Americans couldn't take it. So such things sometimes help to convince somebody. But you know my approach to postmodern. However, I think it is a good point to make some reference to some basic values that I find in Europe. I identify with these values. I am somehow proud of Europe. However, Europe is an is a terrible continent and produced also terrible things. But let us, maybe let me quote you some adventure I, I, I had many years ago. It was precisely, I think, 88 or 89. Last years of communism. And at that time, Mr. Mikhail Gorbachev was the president of Soviet Union. And Mr. Reagan, Ronald Reagan, was president of the United States. And Mr. Reagan paid an official visit to to Soviet Union. And then, of course, he was revisited by Gorbachev, but Gorbachev also paid a visit to Poland. And we were under dictatorship of Mr. Jaruzelski, the general who was also first secretary of the Communist Party. And Gorbachev decided that he wants to have a meeting with so-called intelligentsia, or this a bit less than intellectuals. And this was organized for him because he wanted it to be televised to Soviet Union to show that he is open and courageously faces people who disagree with him. And of course, most of people invited were, be, were ready to agree with him, whatever he said. I was picked up as one of these opposition people who were, I have a reputation of a rather phlegmatic person, so I am not violent. And they believed if I say something, it won't be offensive. In fact, I thought I must not be offensive because it is, makes no good to anybody to offend Gorbachev, who was pushing towards Perestroika. He was pushing towards the end of Soviet Union. We didn't believe at that time that this is so close, the end, but we believed strongly that he is a better choice than any other Soviet leader. So my task was double, to be, uh, to say something what I have in mind and to point out that I am not part of this system, but at the same time, at least I am not supporter of the system, but from the other hand, not to offend the president of the superpower in my country. He was a guest. And I think it was only Holy Spirit that helped me, because I invented something. You know, we all have in pocket lots of thoughts that we can use for an interview when we want to sound intelligent and brilliant. 
you know, this is something, it's part of your profession if you are directors. You must be ready to impress journalists with some knowledge which you can steal from internet. And <laughs> it, it helps a lot. And I had this moment of mm, illumination and I made a little speech because we were asked to make a speech in front of Mr. Gorbachev and in front of television cameras that were broadcasting it to all over the Soviet Union. And I said that a prefabricated thought that there were so many civilizations on this world. The oldest maybe Chinese, Egyptian, that lasted over 4,000 years, Indian, that has continuity. They were African civilizations. They were civilizations in South America that we know little about. But of, of all the civilizations, only one created this incredible acceleration, development, and growth. In Egypt, 4,000 years, grandson and grandfather lived the same life. Almost the same in China. Changes were almost unnoticeable. While in Europe, something happened and we got this incredible acceleration and we are still leading the planet with our daughter because America United States may be considered daughter. That's what Mrs. Thatcher was saying. And we are absolutely unique. We found solutions of the biggest problems of humanity, of the starvation, of... of, 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 of uh, we, are, we have created heating, energy, light, and we exported it to other continents. Asia is not starving anymore because of green revolution and this was invented in Europe. So we have great achievements, but also our civilization committed great crimes. We were so proud of ourselves that we were looking down on other civilizations in the 19th century and we were stupid, arrogant and ignorant. And then we produced First World War and Second World War. And we produced the two terrible totalitarisms. And we produced racism. All this is also produce of Europe. So we have our glorious side and our shameful side. We disappointed ourselves and our ancestors who believed that once we have science and progress, we are on the right track. We were on this right track and we went wrong. And I said it shorter and simpler to Mr. Gorbachev. And then I made a conclusion saying that our civilization is marked very clearly by Judeo-Christian concept, religion, theology. And only Judeo-Christian thought put human being to such a place in the universe that made him creative and gave impulse to human rights and all the important achievements of humanity. So I said, if Soviet Union now is facing such great problems with economy, with technology, with this, uh, social problems, maybe it is before because Soviet Union would went astray too far away from Judeo-Christian roots. Well, that was my prefabricated thought I sold to Russian viewers on television. Later on, I know that the Polish Prime Minister, whom I happen to know, the Communist Prime Minister, was walking Mr. Gorbachev around Old City in Warsaw. And Gorbachev was asking about all the speakers, and we were many. And about me, he had only one question. This film director, is he Jewish because he doesn't look like? <laughs> because I'm using the expression Judeo-Christian, which is not common in Orthodox Russia. It was not common in Europe neither. It's only after 
Concilium of Vaticanum Secundum, that this concept, this connection, that Christianity doesn't start from the zero point, it is still not deeply digested by Christians. But without this concept, we don't understand our past and we don't understand our contemporaneity. So I wanted to tell you that because I think we have to refer narrating our life to some values which are basic values for Europe and have been developed and introduced. And now let me make a jump to a field where I, not, I don't feel very well protected. However, I will risk to tell you what I understand what happened in last 50 years or 60 from the mid 50s of, 19, of 20th century. Great revolution occurred in thinking and I'm afraid that people with humanistic background know very little about it. It happened in physics due to the mathematics. And I will take as a slogan words of Albert Einstein, who was not confessional, but who was addressing a people with humanistic background in the 30s, in 36, I think, he formulated a phrase, who doesn't feel mystery is blind and deaf. So he said something what is revolutionary, that all illuministic, all what we have from the Enlightenment is over, because Newton is over, and because Voltaire is over. This is the period when humanity believed that all what we know is sure and final, and if we don't know something yet, we will know it tomorrow. Today's physics says something opposite. There are things we will never know because we cannot know them. Nobody can know. And we have discovered that the world based on deterministic view is not scientific anymore. It was scientific yesterday, but not today. Today's world we read as probabilistic. And when there is a probability, there is mystery. There is a question, is there somebody behind it or not? Is it a blind chance or is it God? Both possible. But this is an open question and whoever has mind still in, an, in enlightenment is backwards. It is tacky to be sure our days. Tacky that means it's not, it's not modern anymore, but people who believe they are modern, they don't know it. And this opening up towards mystery is something that I hope will mark this century. And of course, mystery doesn't mean silly prejudice and doesn't mean all this silly magic aspects, but even magic is not so stupid as we used to believe when we were under influence of Voltaire. Today, many physicists will agree that future is present somewhere. We cannot talk about space and time because we must imagine that space and time, space and time like Immanuel Kant suggested, belong to us. They are not so objective as we believe. That's our way of how we perceive the world. But that's not the only possible perception. So maybe the movement of time that goes backwards is as likely as movement of time that goes forward. And then a gypsy who is reading your hand, 90% that she is a liar, but 10% she may have an intuition which is bigger in her brain because half of her brain is open to something what we locked out in our brains. And this I know from really competent people who are in modern physics. This is my privilege that I have sometimes access to them. 
And I think it translates to our storytelling. It's not an abstraction. How do you see a growth of human being? How do you see our choices? And what do you think is good and what is bad? What happens to your protagonist? Are you happy that this happened to him or her? Or do you feel with your spectator that it's a pity that this happened to him? Without evaluating, we cannot tell any story. We must be evaluating. And political correctness became a trick to avoid conflict. And because we try to avoid conflict in social life, well, it's good. Nobody wants to live in conflict, but sometimes conflict is necessary. In science, you must have conflict. If you have no conflict, there is no progress. There is no development. In society, when there is an injustice, there must be a conflict. We must not hide it. And the easiest way to avoid the conflict is, say, is to say, okay, we differ, but there is no truth. So your truth is for you, my truth is for me. And we can live next to each other without conflict. No. I think better confront your ideas. And one is right and one is, or one is more right, one is less right. But confrontation, it doesn't mean, mean that you have to kill your adversary, what people usually do when they recognize that they have different opinions. We may fight because dialogue is a fight. But we must believe that one is more right, one is less right. If everybody is equally right, then we are living in chaos. And then we are telling stories which are chaotic and which are sometimes senseless. So this is something what is my message, let's say overall message. And now I think what can I show you to interrupt this monologue and to make it a little bit more, more cinematic and less, uh, less abstract. Uh, what should I take? It was already rather heavy what I said, and now I think about one of my heaviest films, which I, I must say I, I, I rather, I'm not in a position to judge my films, but this is the one I'm quite proud of. That is called Imperative. I shot it in the, uh, in the 80s, it looks older because it's black and white. It is a German-French co-production, shot in English. And it has at least one element that may interest you. I must show you something like <coughs> 12 minutes of the opening, the long scene. The film is built that there is a very long scene at the beginning, and then the following scenes are all shorter, and then there is less and less dialogue. But it starts like a stage play. And what I find quite important is to notice something what is very often neglected by the generation brought up on computers. It is the notion of something that is even difficult to pronounce. Irreversibility. Things that happen cannot be erased. There is no button delete in life. It is only on the computer. Whatever you do will last forever with you. You may overcome your mistake, but you have to, to digest it, to accept it, to recognize it. Everything is irreversible in, the, in our life because we are in the stream of time. So this lightheartedness that many storytellers propose today lead us to the lie, to the, something that is untrue. And my protagonist, who is definitely crazy, and I talk about his craziness, I think great people sometimes are called crazy, and correctly. He is a mathematician, and of course he's a created character, but he's somebody obsessed by quest for sense, because otherwise he would not accept to live in chaos. If life makes no sense, he will like to, suicide, to, to kill himself. I don't want to tell you the ending, but there, he is not killing himself at the end, even if he is very close. But he finds sense. 
And now, at the beginning, he is an agnostic. He is confronted with another mathematician who is a believer. And this believer, that's a joke for you because you know, you have, you have the same background as we have, you have communism. I was shooting this film in the 80s. I was allowed to leave Poland. They gave me my exit visa, that means my passport. But I had to submit my script to the Polish Minister of Culture for permission, even if Poland was not involved at all. They were only involved that they were touching 20% of my salary. But 20% was generous at that time. I didn't complain. But they read the script. It happened before a couple of times I shot films on the West. But suddenly, they read the script that plays in a small university between in the Saarland, between France and Germany, about a mathematician. And they called upon me and said, no, Mr. Zanussi, we cannot approve you doing this film. So I said, for God's sake, why? And they said, there is a character of a professor, and he was a white Russian emigrant. If there is a character of any Russian in the film, <coughs> Polish Minister of Culture in the 80s had to refer to the Soviet embassy, and they have to, to give an approval. And they said if he is a white Russian in, in Germany or France, no approval. So don't even try. What I did immediately, I took my pencil, and said, oh, sorry, it is a mistake in typing. He is Serbian. <coughs> oh, if he's Serbian, that's okay. With Yugoslavia, <laughs> we have no such agreement. And that why, that's why, speaking Russian, he will be Serbian. Because I needed and wanted somebody who is orthodox, who is representing this current of, of uh, Christianity, which is more radical, sometimes more spiritual, sometimes less focus on ethics, but Protestants are most focused on ethics, and Catholics are somehow in the middle. And I thought, this is an important character for me, and he is a master and a kind of a tutor of a spiritual leader to my leading pro young professor. The actor who is acting as a young professor <coughs> is somebody who for a moment was a big international star because he acted as a Jesus Christ in Zeffirelli, Jesus of Nazareth. And as you maybe remember, Jesus of Nazareth of Zeffirelli had enormous uh, commercial success, both as a TV series, a mini series, and as a film with many stars because all the famous actors of the world were acting <laughs> in this film. I don't want to judge what is my feeling about uh, this film, but uh, I took the same actor, Robert Powell, mostly because he was very cool and very intelligent and very analytically minded. And the, his friend, uh, they are not married, but they are a couple, is Brigitte Fossé. So people who study history of cinema remember she shot more than 100 French films. And as a girl, she already became a star. In '45, I think she made her debut. So I just mention actors who are going to appear. You will not see the third actress who is a double Oscar winner, Leslie Caron, who is playing the mother, but she appears later in the film. And I would like to propose you this beginning, because you see the structure of the scene. You see, I build it on the fact that one character's character, the male, the man, behaves in an eccentric way. In fact, there's an innocent eccentricity. But for a professor of mathematics to be eccentric is already kind of a challenge. It is his disagreement with the world, with his own ideas, with himself. And I hope there is some tension so this 10 minutes when they fight uh, at the morning is something that introduces the rest of the story. And then I would like you to see the beginning of his lecture on mathematics and 
this is the presentation of the conflict. Conflict is a quest for sense. Do we know something for sure in life? And of course it is not easy subject matter to sell to the public. Public, public prefers James Bond than philosophical reflection. But you may try and this film at least brought some money. It was not a failure. Nobody went bankrupt. So it is to encourage you that such films can be done. However, it's very unlikely to find somebody ready to finance. But I found. And not privates. It was found by public money. Shot in 1982, if I remember correctly. So let us go now with the imperative. It got silver, uh, silver <coughs> lion in Venice in the main competition. And Robert Powell got prize for the best actor. So I was very honored, and there was a red carpet and all the attributes of success. Unfortunately, I couldn't bring this film to Poland, because as long as communism was, was ruling, they didn't want to, to show something like that. Let us go ahead with imperative. Seventeen minutes to be precise. What for? For it to fall. There's a warm breeze. It's thawing the snow and every so often it falls. Aren't you cold? Seventeen minutes from the moment I began timing. Not that that makes any difference. Something the matter? Couldn't sleep. Something in the air, change in the weather, perhaps. Take something. What? Down there. No. Why not? What's the point in suffering? To get off that windowsill. No, I won't. Jump out instead. But you won't. Why should you? No reason. 
Why did the snow fall? No reason for that either. Were you drinking last night? If I, why did you say that? I'm just sitting on the window ledge. At seven o'clock in the morning, without any clothes on, philosophizing a little. So for you, there has to be a reason. No. No, I was not drinking last night. No, there is no reason. Just as there is no reason why I should climb out of the window. That is not to say that I shan't. Fine. You won't do anything stupid. Because you're not inclined to do anything stupid. And to go walking around in the snow, stark naked at seven in the morning, is stupid. Especially for a lecturer in mathematics with a promising future. That was petty. Stupid provocation. You seem to think that everything I do is designed deliberately to annoy you. You always have to find the motivation, don't you? Can't step out of your charmed circle of cause and effect. Your dark salivates at the sight of food and your little mice run around a maze in search of cheese. You're blind. Stupid by my signs. Somebody has to be a realist. If only to cook breakfast for a visionary who sits freezing his kidneys on the window ledge. Since women are the mainstay of the species, and they don't get carried away by extremes. That's right. I keep explaining to you. Women have been mystics, saints, courtesans. You don't all have to be so limited by your sex. Then find yourself another one. It's only a question of will. It could be different if you wanted to, if you chose to be. For God's sake, will you get down? It's getting light. People will see you, students. Why must you make a spectacle of yourself? There's no sense in it. Have you any idea what sense is? What it signifies? In your biologist's brain, sense is adaptation for survival. What I do makes no sense. It serves no useful purpose. And that is precisely why I'm doing it! Now, I'm going to walk out onto that window ledge and I'm going to go down the drain pipe. And you will shrug your shoulders and retreat to the kitchen so that you don't have to watch. And you will do that because that is the way you are conditioned. Why must I stand there and watch you make an idiot of yourself just to prove you wrong? Rationalizing in the window will only give you a cold. Do get dressed. Why should I? In order to go to work. Why should I? In order to make some money. I don't have to. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to get dressed, or make money, or live. The day before yesterday, you said that all a man is obliged to do is to die. It was better put that way. That was the professor.
is like a parrot. Do you ever stop to think what they mean? Do you find your philosophy so original? It may not be original. But it exists. I think. Therefore, I experience something that is beyond your comprehension. Even though you can put a word to everything and argue with all the Latinisms in your bloody zoology. I know, I know you can, you can talk abstractions by the hour, but you only, you only experience what you can touch, taste, or smell. No thought ever affects you as an experience. Thought or not, you don't experience anything. You're improving. The contradiction is about as far as you will get. Shall I climb out with you? Please come on. <laughs> Pavlov's dark conditioned determinism! You are not normal! Did you say not normal? Yes. For a long time, it's hereditary. And you weren't afraid of having a child, were you? <coughs> now I would be. Oh, that's not true. You can't, you can't believe that. Me for, for just a piece of eccentricity, it didn't hurt anybody. It's, it, it, it's not our norm to, to try and find one's freedom.
statistics deal with averages? What are averages? There are no aggregates in nature, only individual facts. All aggregates are products of the mind. Man arranges the phenomena of nature, combining them into individual classes by means of concepts, and concepts don't exist materially. To me, at any rate, there's no such thing as a world of ideas. What of Caesar Rivers? They are aggregates which exist objectively. What exists objectively are particles of water and sand. You combine them into a nominal whole by employing the concept of sea or river. And what follows from that? Exists. He's a product of the mind if ever there was one. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. What does the answer depend on? Toss a coin. To prove God's existence, you mean? Yes. You put it that way. Thank you very much. <coughs> that was a long fragment that probably scared you, but I will show you sometime some other films I've done to prove that something sometimes is more less extravagant. This is quite extravagant film, definitely. But I like to show it to you because the question I'm asking in the film, I'm asking also in life, it is how do you present our choices, our, that means human choices. Are you tempted to be in this illuministic tradition that shows that whatever we do is determined? You are as you are because you had such parents, such a school, such a society, 
such a background, such genes. Or you talk about human being having all this conditionment, but having some space of freedom and choosing one thing or another. This is a basic question of every storyteller. You have to have your view on life. And it has to be consistent. You cannot do it in one scene, show one conviction and in another scene, different conviction. That makes many of our films very, not only inconsistent, but not convincing. So you have to have your own view why things happened, happen. And without, you, have to, you may have it intuitively, it doesn't need to be a Proclaimed, it doesn't need to be uh, put in words, but you must have a very clear intuition. What do you think happens in life? Why people behave as they behave? Where is the explanation? Is there an explanation? You must confront this question. Without confronting it, your stories will be, will be futile and not, not very serious. You have to have a view. Where is the limit of our freedom? Is there any freedom left? And I brought this dialogue because it, I wrote it many years ago, I think. I know more about it today than I knew when I was writing it. I am recalling statistics. And just if you have to have some touch of, of, the, of the question, Think that in such a city like Budapest, I guess three people must die tonight in a car crash or be hit on the street. If there are four, tomorrow there will be less. But no way, if there is nobody killed tonight, next night there will be twice as many. Go to the police, they will tell you. This is absolutely proven. But is it going to be you? We all believe not. It will happen to the others, but it will happen to somebody. And I would like a storyteller to deal with this question, to give me your suggestion. What do you think about it? What your intuition tells you? I don't give you an answer. I don't have an answer. But it's good to think about it. Now back to the story. You know, my cameraman with whom I worked at that time made a big Hollywood career. He shot Harry Potter and uh, with Ridley Scott and many other films. Now he is not available for me, unfortunately. <laughs> so sometimes when you contribute to somebody's career, then you are a victim. But he's a very good friend, but has no time to shoot small European films. And my composer, who passed away two years ago, we were very close friends. And there was a kind of strange relationship that I behaved like, like an unhappy wife who is betrayed by, by the husband because he was making, writing music to directors like Francis Ford Coppola in Hollywood, like Jane Campion, like Polanski, like Vaida, like Kishlovsky. And I was always very jealous of his music that he has written to the others. And I was making him reproaches, saying, how dare you to write such a good music to Coppola? And he was telling me, make such a good film, I will write you such a good music. <laughs> and in spite of that, our, free, uh, our friendship survived. Think how strong it was, because our artist's ego is always very touchy. So it is just for your information. Uh, well. I wanted maybe to show you two other fragments of, other, of another film and then we will have some time for questions and, and all other remarks you would like to have. I will show you something of my, well, it's still my latest film because my new film is now in, uh, in editing. I brought it, but I don't want to show it, even if they have some scenes where Hungarian actor is acting and he's acting so well. Uh, but uh, it is editing, so it is not ready yet. And this is my previous film, uh, in which 
I would like to show you three scenes which are somehow pointing out a problem that you can develop and make another film. First thing I will point out is a scene with the mother, is an adoptive mother, and she's an old lady, but she is a Stalinist criminal. We have such people everywhere. You have them in Hungary, I have them in Poland. People who are guilty of somebody's death, of death of innocent people, and people who are not punished. And some of them at least said sorry. But many of them say no, it was right, it was just postmodern. It was a different truth of the time and this, there is a different truth today. I find it very corruptive and very dangerous to our culture and civilization if we admit that everything is relative and somebody who is hurting other person, who is doing something criminal, is now saying it was such, such a time we had to do act like that. Now this person is interviewed and this will be the scene I want to show you. So let us go like 10 minutes from the beginning and we will try to find the beginning of the scene. And then there will be another scene when my young protagonist, who is Italian, has been summoned up by his boss in the big international corporation because she wants to humiliate him. We know it from the previous scene. And she forbids him to have a little rosary ring. Not because she cares, in fact. She says, I don't care, but I want him to obey my whims, not only orders. I can order that in, my corpora in this corporation we must not expose our identity, neither ethnic nor religious. It is very fashionable. Many corporations have such a policy. And I think this is a disaster that is now touching Europe because we cannot, we must live next to each other recognizing differences and not hiding them. If we don't, when we hide them, nothing good will happen. So let me see a little bit farther, but not very much. <coughs> forward, that's the conversation with the father. And a little bit fast forward. <laughs> These are the, the credits and a very important dialogue between two lovers, but this is, and this I will also skip. And by the end of the scene we may start. The young Italian has arrived to Poland because his girlfriend, uh, let us go slow now. And if you may make it a little louder, I don't know if it is loud enough for the audience. This is the boss of the corporation. Notice the name of the company, we'll tell you something later.
No będę o tym mówiła. Jeżeli oni odważą się dotoczyć mi proces. Odważna. W jakich odwadzam winę? Cała Europa! Przeszła tę chorobę stalinizmu. Wszyscy intelektualiści. Nikt nie chce żadnych rozgryszczeń. Było mi lewo. Dziś mamy ważniejsze sprawy. Ważniejsze niż życie tego człowieka, który pani zabrała, wiedząc, że nic złego nie zrobił? Dobre sobie. Nic złego. Każdy jest czemuś winien. Przepraszam bardzo. Widzę, że pani jednak to jest bardzo wyraźne nastawieniem. Nie jest pan obiektywny, więc niestety nie mogę się zgodzić, żeby pan to dalej nagrywał. Ja i tak to spiszę z pamięci. Jak to się kończy. Tak, to niech pan spróbuje. To chyba pana, prawda? To będzie bardzo łatwo pana znaleźć. Dobrze ci powiedział. Tak. Nie miałam więcej w kieszeni, bo miałam więcej tego wziął. Myślała o tobie. Thank you for the ticket. But you like opera? As an Italian, I have no choice. <laughs> oh. Do you think I might borrow that little rack? Oh, um, I received an email about my rosary ring. Uh, so, I may remove it if you wish. But I should tell you that I have to pray five times a day facing Mecca. Does the corporation intend to forbid that? I wouldn't advise it because of our connection with the oil business. <laughs> In fact, I forgot that an uncle was a shake. Really? Yeah. And it's thanks to him that I happen to work here. I thought it was because of the cardinal. Possibly. I have many uncles. <laughs> like you. Quite a servant, aren't you? Had it crossed your mind that I decide what will happen to you, not your uncle? There is no one to in Italy. Let me give you some advice. If you don't want to be out of work, you have to abide by our rules. But you don't. There's a no smoking policy in this building. Am I right? Really? I love it. Really? I love it when someone stands up to me. Up to a point. <laughs> if that was a test, then it was Poor one. Because they don't smoke. Ciao! <laughs> to za 
rien. Vous se gâtez pèse Je vous tâche bien. Ni à vous, je n'y ai Też długo nie awansujesz. Też myślę, że za długo. Ok, let us now go fast forward, like one hour. I would like to show you something what is more, when there is more action, and tell you something about shooting action scene. Pewna seria. Still fast forward. Well, we have to jump another 20 minutes forward. A little bit backwards now. We are in Russia and that's what I wanted to show you. So please to the back, even more to the back. A little bit, a little bit there, back, 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 please. Okay, we can stop here for a moment. And I will tell you something, what I'm showing you. Because this film was co-produced by Russia. And later on it was, first I got even some prize in Russia. The, the, the Orthodox University gave me some uh, prize too and they were very happy but later on they changed their mind and said that I'm showing Russia in a bad light because the prison in Russia is not very comfortable well where is where prison is comfortable tell me in America they never show comfortable prisons neither in Switzerland maybe so anyway but I have here something totally different I wanted to show you just to contrast with uh, these other films which are maybe frightening you as, 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 as an example of very art cinema. Here I have a very simple situation. My protagonist lost his driving license, not by coincidence, by a very mean trick that his boss has played on him. I have no time to show you the scene. When the boss, the lady, is asking him to drive her home, and during the way she is, let us say, erotically aggressive. He is in love with somebody else and refuses to be used. And then she apologizes, but offers him a farewell drink and then calls the police and says, stop him because he has some alcohol in blood. And that's how he loses his li driving license. And till the end of the film, he has no driving license. Suddenly they are in Russia and he must drive. And he will drive to bring some papers without understanding that he's bringing a bribe, that he's used by these ladies, because he's a naive Westerner. And as you know, in Russia, it's very easy to manipulate anybody, but to manipulate <coughs> a Westerner is, very, is even more easy than you expect. But what I have is a little chase scene. The film is about God, about feminism, about uh, social conflicts, but it's definitely not kind of James Bond story. But whenever you're filming, some people will prepare for you all possible things to make it look like James Bond. And I had to fight my temptation, because I also like to see a chase, but this chase makes, is not a substance, it's not important. So I had to limit my own desire and not go, not be tempted. And that's something what I suggest to you. Don't get, get tempted because things which are too cinematic are sometimes very banal and superficial. However, we all like scenes like chase. No way. Shooting, blowing, explosions. And here's some practical explanation. It may be of some use for you unless you know it very well. I had a limited budget and I had to crash a very expensive car. It costs fortune. But there is a very simple trick how you can do it, and I did it this way. In Moscow, I visited some garages when they were mending broken cars after accident. And I found a very handsome BMW 
after a crash. And they borrowed this car for the scene. And then the dealer of BMW provided me with another car, BMW new, which is on, in frame. And in one shot, you will see both cars. But I hope you don't notice that the real car, untacked, leaves the frame. And the car, which is crashed, is standing still. It is an inexpensive way to re resolve the problem. So I show it to you. It's nothing particularly exciting, but you can know the trick. It helps sometimes to show something behind the frame. Sometimes it works more than when you show something in the frame. And now in the, be the beginning will be the scene with the, which is, you know, I like to point out when you have a ready film, what was taken from life. So the story of, of a lady aggressive who later on offers a drink and then calls the police is a story that a taxi driver told me. And I thought it's a very clear-cut story. He said, this woman was very attractive, but I felt I'm used, and that was his dignity. He wanted to be a male and not an object. So finally, he refused to, to make love with her, uh, to her in, in a car, and then she brought him home. And they put it to the film one-to-one. -one. There was another story I met in Russia, a monk, a young monk, who, is, who was... A sportsman and he was so strange to me when he said one day I woke up and I understood this is what I am supposed to do and of course I can't I cannot understand him but I, I could reproduce and he appears in my film acted by somebody who is very similar to him even physically so that's another point which I think you may you may be interested in and of course the story that how you give uh, how you bribe people in everywhere. One of the tricks is that you put to somebody's bag, onto somebody's pocket, a bribe, and he doesn't know that it happened, and then he received it. So he may be denounced to the police. It's the same like driving license, it's the same uh, scheme. You make innocent person look guilty, and then it is easy to to press, to, to make a blackmail, to chantage, this is all possible. So this little fragment I want to show you, and then it will be time for, the, for uh, questions and answers. Let us go ahead. Once the soul has departed, it's only matter. And uh, the son holds his mother's soul in his hand. Looks like an embryo. The soul is somehow similar to an embryo. An embryo is a harbinger of a person, but the soul is a person's essence. can, but not the monks. But you're a monk. <laughs> you don't think I look like one? Well, I am. <laughs> but only recently. I used to play basketball. What made you change? Should I make a public confession? <laughs> we say ex orientalux, that light comes from the east. But how is it here, in the east? The light comes from God. But I don't know if God is in the East. 
All I know is that he's in our hearts. He paid me a visit. Did he visit because you asked him to? No. I asked for nothing. He chooses. And he pointed at me. I don't know why. I had a good life before then. Did you have a girlfriend? Did I have a girlfriend? <laughs> uh, girls used to chase me. I could take my pick. You want to ask if I ever regret it? <laughs> did you become a believer? Why did you light a candle? Isn't it what you do in an Orthodox church? This is the PMW. We provide people with light. A strategy is simple and transparent. transparent. A very big star of Russian cinema. You will find that our offer is the best. None of our competitors can build a power line to Poland and then also Western Europe cheaper than we can. So we await your decision. We believe in the future of this contract. We have powerful competitors. But we believe that we are more powerful than they are. Our assets, our technology, organization, and more than anything, our employees. It's enough just to look at who is working for us. Please welcome Chris Nielski, head of our Polish division. She was responsible for our faith, and if we win this contract, it's possible that she will oversee the whole operation. So we can now give the floor to Miss Okay, so I wanted to show you this fragment to prove you that sometimes I'm also chasing cars in my films. However, it is not my strong point. It's not what I'm interested in. Maybe to conclude that 
when we talk about, when I try to convince you that you have to have a clear outlook on life when you want to tell stories. If you are confused, your story will be confused. You may be wrong, but you must have to have a vision how the work, world works and how things happen. And you have to bring it to the audience. And one remark, which is to me a very sad remark, that this great art that Greeks have left with us, the drama, Greek drama, <coughs> has been particularly ruined by such an irrelevant phenomenon like telenovela. It was, telenovela was invented as a soap opera in America, in the radio, and it is, what is characteristic is the continuation, it has open end. It is not miniseries, because miniseries is different. But in this classic form of te endless telenovela, you're expressing unconsciously the view that life makes no sense. One person is born, one person is dead. If they married, they divorced. Child is born, child is uh, sick. Everything is like mashed potatoes. Nothing is important. Nothing is crucial. Greeks taught us that there are some key moments of the life. These crucial moments, and our life depends what choice we make in a critical situation. And it will linger with us the rest of our life. Telenovela tells you everything is irrelevant, one person will die, one will be born, you will learn that he is not his father, but somebody else is the father, there will be a legacy, somebody leaves with great money, you become rich, you become poor. All is absolutely irrelevant. It is very postmodern. And it's very sad, I hope, that intelligent people don't watch this idiocy. The way they do, they should go to co for confession if they are believers, because that's sinful in my opinion. <laughs> it's self destruction. Anyway, so that's my angry remark about, <laughs> about uh, telenovelas. And now I wonder, do you want to like, make a little break and then question and answer session, or immediately question and answer and then home? And be careful, because statistics says <laughs> that there will be some accidents tonight. <laughs> Did I take you a surprise? I was warning that there will be some questions. At least there will be some expected questions. You are <laughs> obliged to ask them. But is there something that you would like to disagree about? That would be a good beginning. Nobody ready to, to defend telenovela? <laughs> because it is a part of popular culture, of course. But then again, what is popular doesn't need to be good. So, did I explore enough or do, are you tired enough to, to conclude this session? We will see each other tomorrow, I understand. And then we will be talking about all 22 proposals, scripts, which I have read. You have to understand, I, I, I don't know them well enough, but you will remind me and I will keep them in hand. And I would like to discuss with you, having the same principles I was de declaring today. This, this, this first question, you remember, everybody will have to tell me. Why? First question is, why should I know this story? What is the relevance of this story? And the other question which you must expect is, whom do I like in this story? If you don't answer me this question, the story to me is irrelevant. I must like somebody. He may be a criminal. He may be an awful character. But I must be with somebody. Otherwise, I'm indifferent. And I'm not interested in visiting world as we visit zoological garden. I don't want to see that other people are like that. No, tell me 
am I like one of them? If I identify, and I can identify with the murderer, right? I can I identify with the pedophile, whoever you want. If you present it to me in a good way, I will identify, I will suffer, I will feel empathy. But you have to take care about it. And don't demonstrate me the world, because this is definitely, I have it looking from my window every day. I don't want to see just life of the others. I want very much to identify with life of the others in one case that you present to me. So this will be my, my point of, your, of the criticism tomorrow. And you, are, you have whole night to prepare your great defense. <laughs> so please. Yes, my current project is here, and I just finished yesterday. I think it is a final cut, but I was still hesitant about the ending. It is a story that plays, it's called Ether, and it is about Ether, which was invented as a great weapon that takes away pain, but also consciousness. So it may also be used to submit other people, to dominate them. And it's a story slightly inspired by the myth of Faust, where you have somebody who wants to have power, and Ether is such a power. It plays before World War I, so it plays partly in mostly Austro-Hungary. That's why I had co-production, and I had marvelous Hungarian actors really very good, an incredible s setting here in Budapest. And in Ost... How do you call it? Ost Osterholm? Michelgrad. No, Osterholm. Estergom. Estergom. Because, you know, in Polish, we have a Polish name for this city because we have a medieval relationship. So when I say Ostrzychom, I know where it is. <laughs> but, you know, with you Hungarians, that's always a problem. There's somebody has a script which plays in Cluj, and I know it is Kolozsvár. <laughs> and I have to learn it three times because there's also a German name. And that's our complex Central Europe. So that's more or less the story. And I try to show to tell this story in a very extravagant way. I'm not sure if it works or not. Because I tell the full story as a very realistic story. And then I come back and show it again in f like on the fast fast motion showing where David appears. And David appears in person. And that's the Hungarian actor who is very good in it. <laughs> <laughs> so you will see if you like it or not. But definitely will be with Tune what I was talking about today because this is what I what I have now in my in my head. How do you come up with your stories? Listen, I collect them all the time. I collect them because you know, when I was a film student, our professors were asking us every week to bring some story or some observation. And Monday morning, we were all desperately thinking, <laughs> because it was like a lottery, who is better? We're competing, trying to find a good story. Once it was a story I've seen, once somebody told me something. But always to have something, what is a twist, what will be good, and I put it to my notebook, and I have l many notebooks, and then <coughs> some stories come back, and you start to build the script. You think, this is what I would like to tell now. But you have to have a big archive of observations, of little notes, which are, at the beginning, totally disinterested. You, you are not going to make this film tomorrow, maybe in 10 years. But take a note, because otherwise you're sitting in front of the white paper and you have no idea whatsoever. When you go to the notebook, you say, oh, well, this idea was not so bad. Maybe we can do something. And then you try to work on transformation, which is the most interesting process. You take one story and you transform it to another story. But the structure is the same and structure inspires. Like when I told you now how to manipulate somebody and denounce him. It is a structure. And then you may find other examples, how people did it, how it could happen. But you must have always this little hook to hang your story on. 
when there is no hook, it's very difficult to start. But I suggest you always start with the scene, not with the problem, not with the idea. But when you have a good situation, when you have a good scene, in some of your, of your scripts you submitted, I found good scenes. I was very happy because sometimes there are script seminars when there is no one single scene. <laughs> And here it was something what immediately gave me a feeling this person is already close to tell me a story because the scene is there, the situation is there. And that helps a lot without situations, without some moment. But let me tell you, I was doing a lot of exercises in various countries, having always the same kind of scheme. I say, tell me a story two minutes, three minutes, not more. I do it, do it in one take to make it easier without editing because we have to focus on one thing. And there must be a twist. Something must change. And you know, people are sometimes inventing incredibly interesting stories, just like the, the, if they were taken from the notebook. A Russian student made me a story about a lady who was locking her apartment get into the courtyard and on the courtyard there are many other people standing and looking up because in the window on the fifth floor a man is standing and he looks as if he was wanting willing to jump the woman runs back to the house gets to her apartment and takes milk from the gas kitchen because she forgot to switch off the gas <laughs> and that was her association it's a philosophical story <laughs> about, I don't know about what, but, <laughs> you know, I, want to, I, I was happy to see it. And it was such a futile, small twist. And it was already interesting. And, you know, there are hundreds of such stories. A student two weeks ago presented me with a story of a corridor and a toilet. And one lady is going down the corridor, gets to the toilet, and in a moment, she screams and jumps out from the toilet, runs down the corridor. Comes with another woman. They both open the door, enter, camera does not. They both scream and run away. And they come third time with men with arms, who must be some kind of a, a local policeman. We enter with him this toilet, and there is nothing. So we, we leave, this lady apologizes, this man goes down, and some other man goes to the toilet, gets in and screams because again something happened, or a ghost has appeared. But you know, it is such a twist at the end that we think these stupid women have invented something, and then they say this stupid policeman thought there is nothing, there is something and we don't know what. You know, mystery in such a small form is already attractive. So I just throw you things which were done recently. Of course, there are more interesting and more exciting twists that you can use in a film. If you have three minutes, I will tell you one real, from real, no, I won't tell you because we have cameras. I will tell you, to, to, no, no, because there are some stories, it's about the historical person and I wouldn't like to to publicize it, but I can tell it to the, to the colleagues, that's another thing. So, you know, important is to collect stories, and I, I wish you were collecting stories every day. What interesting happened, what kind of misunderstanding, what kind of misinterpretation, what kind of strange situation occurred. When you don't see it, you are not a storyteller, and you need a scriptwriter who will write it for you. But the director must co cooperate and be invented himself, inventive himself. If not, you cannot trust the scriptwriter. You must have it good in your own mind. Any other question? If not, I understand. Oh, maybe. No. <laughs> Why did you quit school, film school? Well, I was desperate because I didn't know really what to do with my life. And this was one of of a tries, it was not a decision. The decision was when they kicked me out. Then I have to decide, do I want 
is it really important? And I already knew it is terribly important for me. And I was later on in my life, luckily enough, I was tempted to make a different career. And I didn't. I didn't want to. I knew I liked this, what I do more than anything else. It was already in the last 20 years I was invited to be a in the government, I was invited to be an ambassador. And I'm not bad in, in diplomacy. I have some experience, but filmmaking is far more as exciting, and I believe it is more important. So I don't change. <laughs> now I'm old, so I have nothing, no choices anymore. But my Italian relatives offered me a beautiful career. They wanted to pay my studies in Italy, and they said, you will work in our, in our factories. And they had almost 50,000 workers in their factories. So it was a, a, a really good perspective. And I, I didn't sleep all night, but fortunately I have an intuition. I wasn't a film student yet, but I thought I, in Poland I would have more interesting life. And I was so impressed. They have an airplane. I love airplanes. And they have private airplanes. Then one of my cousins crashed in this airplane. <laughs> but that was by, by coincidence. But you know, you remind me, I, I remind me, it reminds me, crash. I have very particular experience, and it will be a moralistic story, but in fact it is an anecdote. It means anecdote. You know, anecdote is, 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 a, is a story for, for a script writer. It's not something funny. We call it anecdote something what is, the, is like a brick to build a, a wall in storytelling. And you know, I was very proud that in my <coughs> long life I never made any publicity real. I never worked in advertisement. It is my luck because if I had children starving, of course I would have done immediately some advertisement. But a couple of times I was offered and I was saying, no, sorry, I, if I have any talent I'm not going to sell it for shampoo or a beer, or something like that. Maybe arrogant, maybe, you know, however you call it, aloof, but I stick to this. The system has changed in the 90s. My, I'm running a film studio, which is a production house, state-owned, I still run it, and I get an offer. My assistant brings me an offer, quite remarkable money, dozens of thousands of dollars to make advertisement for some Dutch producer. I said, don't be silly. When I was poor, I refused. Now I am not poor. I don't even want to talk about it. But my assistant tells me, listen, are you sure that this is such a beautiful choice that you say no? There are so many people around who need a scholarship who need money for operation, who need money for something crucial. And you say two weeks of your time is too much, you are not going to do it. And I had a second thought, maybe I'm wrong. I asked a friend, who was a bishop, but he was a, he was a friend first of all, and he gave me a strange suggestion. He said, do it. And give half of this money for philanthropy, but take another half and take your wife and make a trip that you always dreamt about and never had money to do. Mm -hmm. I said, but listen, if I, if I prostitute, I will give all my money. I almost said, this is not a good solution because you will, your pride will win over you. You will become proud of your, what you have done and then it has no moral value. Mm -hmm. I accepted it. And I asked my assistant to contact this Dutch producer. If he wants, I will go to Amsterdam. We may talk. He said, oh, no, 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 no. I've come to Warsaw. I want to see Warsaw. I want to see you in person in your country. I've just bought a new Porsche. And I would go because in Germany there is no uh, speed limit. <laughs> Two days later, I got the news. He crashed <laughs> and died. I've never seen him. It's a very mysterious story. <laughs> this crash is a mysterious. The rest is doesn't matter anymore. But what, what was the meaning? Why I didn't I see him ever? Did he really exist? Maybe that's my 
my fantasy, but I'm not a lunatic, <laughs> and there are witnesses. So, you know, such thing is in my notebook, and many others, <laughs> and that's what I use, and maybe I will publish it one day, because I'm old, so how many more films I may do, maybe I should publish so the other people will use, because, you, you know, it's public domain, things are, you, you collect them. Last story I will tell you because I love it. And I sell it to everybody because... And now in Italy, somebody told me that they will use this, this, this story. I cannot use it in Poland. It was in Georgia. Not American Georgia, the real Georgia in Caucasus. I had a lecture at Diplomatic Academy. I'm sometimes lecturing about the cultural diplomacy and all this, blah, blah. It's very nice to travel. And... The rector, after my lecture, felt obliged to invite me for dinner. And, you know, I'm not very good in caucus problems, diplomatic problems. He was not very good in films. But he told me his story, which is a ready script. He said, I was, over the weekend, a couple of years ago, he went to his dacha, to his country house, some time, some, 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 some place away from uh, Tbilisi. And on the way back, you know, the roads in Georgia at that time, even now they are terrible. He was driving and suddenly he has seen a body lying next to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the street, to the road. So he stopped. This man was unconscious, slightly bleeding. And then it's good to keep the details in mind. He said, I took papers, daily papers, to read them over weekend. I didn't read them. I, have them. I had them in the car. But I was afraid that this bleeding man will leave stains on my, on my car. So I, I sacrificed the papers. I put them on the back seat and I put this man, unconscious, to the back seat. And I was going direction to Tbilisi. After some moment, some time, I felt, felt that this man has awoken, has a pistol in his hand, puts it to my back and says, where do you drive me? Well, he said, I said, to the hospital. He says, you don't dare to bring me to the hospital. And fainted, because there was another bump. The man, as a clever Georgian man, said, well, I said to him, all right, no hospital, but he's probably going to die. He brought him to, this, to his house in Tbilisi. He had a little hut for some instruments in his garden, and he put this man there. And at the morning, he brought some food, but he didn't even look inside, preferring not to know what happens. He came in the evening, nobody there, only some blood stains. So what a relief. This man has disappeared, so it means he survived. Maybe somebody came and helped him. Better to forget. He forgot about it, but a couple of weeks later, this man, already in good health, appeared and said, Professor, you saved my life. Oh, he said, I'm very happy, yes, if I saved your life. That, that, that's very good. Right, but I owe you something because you saved my life. What can I do for you? So the professor said, what can you want to offer? What can you do? He said, I'm a professional killer. I will kill somebody for you. <laughs> so of course he laughed and said, you're joking. He said, no. And in Georgia, there is no joking matter. He says, look, who is your enemy? Who did something wrong to you? I will resolve the problem. He said, is it the rector? I know where you're working. Did the rector was always fair to you? Didn't they block you in your career? What about your mother-in-law? Was she okay? <laughs> Is she okay? What about neighbor? Did he denounce you to the police? Point out whom I will finish. And that was a real story in Caucasus. It is real. It is in, I cannot make take the story in Poland. Nobody would believe. But in Tbilisi, it is credible. And in Italy, too. In Calabria, it could have happened. In Sicily, as well. So the ending is banal, it's very disappointing, because of course I asked what happened. Because he said, Professor, if you don't point out, I will find myself. I give you a week to think over. And this week would be most interesting to me, when he's meeting various people, 
reminding, talking to them. Do you remember what you did to me two years ago, ten years ago? And so <laughs> it would be a good part of the film. But the final part is that he, as a good Georgian, had a very simple idea. In this village where he has his dacha, he said local peasants wanted to slaughter a cow and sell it illegally without taxes. So he said to the killer, could you kill the cow? And he said, okay, no difference. <laughs> <laughs> and he shot the cow and they have sold <laughs> the meat. So, you know, you can do something with this story. You cannot show it as I told you. But this is public domain. It is, you can use it if you want. <laughs> see what you, I will be happy to see this on screen. <laughs> okay. So it is time to conclude. And tomorrow, I hope I will see 22, 24? 22. No, we'll see how many. Maybe some will be so discouraged after today that they won't come. <laughs> anyway, please come and we will talk. Thank Thanks you. a lot.